Hello, happy World Bug Day. So I've got something a little bit different in our try it section for you. I've got a story for you which is from something which we call flash fiction. This is a short story which has been published, you could go away and buy it on Amazon, but actually we've got a transcript of it online. And one of the things I'd encourage you to do is to have a look at that, there'll be a link down in the description, and to read it along with me. All right, here we go. So it's called The Little Free Library by Naomi Kritzer. Upon setting up her little free library, Megan develops an unexpected friendship with a mysterious book borrower. That's kind of like the blurb. Megan built her little free library from a kit because she wanted to make it into art. She sanded the wood and painted it with primer, then glued on the rock she'd picked up from Lake Superior Shore over the summer and used acrylic paint indigo swirls around them. When she mounted it on the post outside her St Paul's house, she decided to paint the post too. A painted fuchsia rod winding round the post to the box at the top and outlined the road in similar pebbles. There was a little bit of glitter in the future craft paint and she decided that the book cabinet should have some of that as well. Finally, she screwed on the sign that said Little Free Library with the instructions Take a book, return a book. Megan had never seen a Little Free Library before she moved to St Paul's, but here they were everywhere. Each Little Free Library was basically just a box of free books, sheltered from the weather. You could register them on a website, sometimes people specialised in one type of books, or used a second shelf for a seed exchange. She was figuring she'd start by unloading the books she'd enjoyed, but she knew she'd never read again. She'd moved them up with her, but she didn't have enough space, and anyway, they were mostly just gathering dust. Passed along to someone else, they could be read and enjoyed and used. She could see the little free library from her living room window, and watch the first day as some of the neighbourhood kids stopped to peer in. When she checked that afternoon, she noticed that Ender's Game, Dragon Singer, and Danny Don and the Homework Machine had all been taken. The next day, someone had left a copy of The Da Vinci Code, which made her grimace, but hey, there were people who adored that book, so why not? She put in her extra copy of Fellowship of the Ring, along with two Terry Pratchett books. When she got up Tuesday morning, the little free library was empty. They did warn you on the website that sometimes people just cleaned it out, and she'd taken time to stamp her own books, always a gift, never for sale, to hopefully discourage someone from thinking they could resell them to a used bookstore. She heaved a frustrated sigh, restocked it with more books from the box she'd set aside and, after thinking about it, hand wrote a note that people would see before they opened the library. To whomever takes all the books in the future, please take just one or two at a time or consider leaving a book for others to enjoy. For now, I hope you enjoy reading the books you took. Please share them with others when you're done reading. When she got home from work on Tuesday afternoon, someone had taken a copy of The Porn of Prophecy and on the top shelf of the little free library where Porn of Prophecy had been, they'd left behind a sanded piece of wood that on closer inspection she realised was a hand-carved whistle made from a twig. She took that inside and set it on her mantelpiece and then put out Queen of Sorcery. The next day, Queen of Sorcery was gone, and someone had left behind a small metal figurine of a snake. It was very heavy, and reminded her of the antique lead soldiers that had been made as children's toys, but her parents stored on a high shelf as decorative objects, since lead is a terrible material for a child's toy. She took it inside and put it next to the whistle, then set out the next book from the Belgariad. For the next two weeks, the mystery borrower left things behind each day, some of it very strange. A small dark green bird's feather that looked like it had been shed by a blackbird, except for the colour. A tiny clay vessel with a cork held in place with rust-coloured wax. A carved stone animal, too abstract to identify. A circlet of thin carved stone that was too big to be a ring and too small to be a bracelet and a hand-hammered safety pin. These gifts were unnecessary but delightful. Megan took pictures of them and sent the pictures in email to her friends back home, two of whom ordered little free libraries of their own to give away their own spare books. They reported back that these boxes turned out to be a great way to meet their neighbours and everyone thought they were very cool, but they had not been the recipient of feathers or carvings. Then, one day, on a page of brittle yellow paper that looked like it had been cut from one of the blank pages of her older paperbacks. To the librarian. 
Is there a sequel to The Fellowship of the Ring? I would very much like to read it. I will leave behind anything I have for the other books, and uh, if you will give them to me. Also, I am sorry about the day I took everything. I promise I will never do this again. What would you like in trade for the next book about Frodo, if there is one? It was written in ink, slightly blotchy, like the writer had used a dip pen, but didn't quite know how to write with it. Right. St Paul had no shortage of artists and eccentrics. Maybe this could lead to a friendship with someone close by. Grinning to herself, Megan pulled out the two towers from her box of books and slipped in a note. To the person who requested the next book about Frodo, leave me some art you have created and we'll call it a good trade. The Librarian. There was no gift the next day, but the day after, a piece of paper, again cut from the back of a paperback ju book judging by the size, was left behind, rolled up and tied with a red thread. Megan slipped off the thread and unrolled the paper, done in the same slightly brownish ink as the letter. It was a line drawing of a cat. This was getting really fun. Megan wondered which of her nibs it was. Another request should be coming soon. No one finishes the two towers and doesn't want to read The Return of the King. In the meantime, she left out the next book from the Belgariad, a Valdemar novel, and a picture book about a small fire-breathing dragon's trip to the dentist. Sure enough, another note was left the next day. To the librarian. Surely there is another book about Frodo. I've drawn you another picture, but if you would prefer something else, I can provide it. The person had drawn a picture of a leaf under the note. It looked like a maple leaf with five lobes, but with additional hooks and spikes and edges, so it looked almost fractal. To my correspondent, she wrote, please leave me a leaf like the one you drew. She was expecting something cut out, maybe from paper, but it was a real leaf that got left in the place of the return of the king, green and fresh from the tree. It almost looked like a maple leaf, but not. For extra weirdness, it was February and there weren't any green blooming trees in her neighbourhood. It was grey and frigid and everything was blanketed with snow. But maybe, maybe they put a leaf in the freezer or something. Or maybe the leaf had dropped off some sort of potted tree they kept in the house. Or maybe they'd picked it illicitly whilst visiting the St Paul's Conservatory, which was filled with tropical trees. She took a picture of the leaf and sent it to her friend back home with a botany hobby to see if she could identify it. A friend sent her back a slightly baffled message. It did look like a maple, but not a variety of maple she was familiar with. She suggested that Megal try the extension service at the U. Instead, Megan stashed it on top of her refrigerator and tried not to think about it. A fun correspondence with an artist playing a game was really all she wanted to imagine herself doing. But a day later, when she went outside to restock it, she left behind a copy of Defending Your Castle, which she'd bought because it looked hilarious, but only ever skimmed through, since she had no real intention of digging a moat around her house or installing a ballista. The book was gone the next day. To the librarian, I don't know what I did to deserve the favour of the gods, but I am grateful, so grateful for your kindness to me. I believed our cause to be lost. I believed that I would never have the opportunity to avenge what was done to my family. Now, suddenly, I have been gifted with a way forwards. Blessings on you. If you can bring me more such books, I will leave every scrap of gold I can find. The gold coin was a tiny disc, the size of a dime, but thinner. There was an image of a bird with spread wings stamped on one side. The other side showed either a candelabra or a rib cage. Megan wasn't sure. Megan's kitchen stall thought the coin weighed four grams, which, if it actually was gold, was worth a hundred dollars of gold. Of course, most gold colored metal items weren't actually gold, but it was notably heavy for its tiny size. And when she tried a magnet, it was most definitely not magnetic. In theory, she could have bitten it, but she didn't want to mess up the picture stamped in. For the first time, she felt a pang of uncertainty. What was really going on here? Who am I giving books to? An artist, she told herself firmly. A storyteller. A neighbour. This is probably bronze or brass or some other yellow metal. And they'd hammer it themselves as a hobby, just like they carved whistles and all the rest. She tucked in a colouring book about Roman aqueducts and left a note. 
Who are you? She also left behind a notepad, since the thought of someone cutting blank pages out of books to write on made her feel odd. A few minutes later, she went back out and added a pen. I am a servant to the rightful queen and heir, displaced by her uncle. At his orders, she took vows to join an order of lay sisters, where she lived ever since. But all my prayers were answered the day I found your library, and I will forever be your servant, librarian of the books of the tree. We have begun constructing a ballista in secret. Please send me more books. Megan bought a copy of the knowledge, how to rebuild civilization, to put in the box. Then a book on military history, then weapons by the diagram group, then R an army tactical manual. Each book was rewarded with coins, all of them stamped with candelabra or skeleton and bird, all of them gold, or gold coloured at least. She was finding it increasingly hard to concentrate on anything other than her library, on new books to leave, on who exactly might be coming, on whether she really still believed that it was an artist and a neighbour playing an interesting game with her. Twice she tried to watch the box from her living room overnight, but both times she fell asleep. Finally, one day she found a note. We are ready. Many thanks for all your help. Pray for our victory. And then the note stopped. Someone did take a copy of Greek fire, poison arrows and scorpion bombs, but did not leave a coin or a letter. After a few days she gathered up the coins and took them to a jeweller who told her that yes, they were real gold and he would give her $1,245 for the lot if she wanted to sell them. No one spends over a thousand dollars on a joke. She didn't want to sell them. If she'd been about to lose her house, she definitely would have done. But the thought of parting with this tangible evidence of whatever had happened, no. She told the jeweller she'd think about it and took them home again. Back at her house, she went looking for the leaf she'd left on the top of her refrigerator. But it had dried up and crumbled away. She looked through the gifts again, the ones that had been left before the coin started. She could take them to someone, maybe see what they thought if they would think she was crazy. If they didn't think this stuff was stolen, it occurred to her that it might in fact be stolen. It may be someone who was playing a game with her and that person blithely gave away $1,200 worth of gold because it didn't actually belong to them. But she looked through the pictures of ancient coins and found nothing that looked like what she had. The hand-forged safety pin was a fibula though and she had found some pictures that were similar. Some were from ancient Greece and ancient Rome, some were from modern artists selling their wares on Etsy. One warm night, spring had finally arrived. She set up a chair in her yard and tried again to sit and watch. She dozed, despite herself, and startled awake at some odd hour of the very late night and looked. The box was gone. Missing. She stared at its spot and then she saw it. It was back or it had never actually gone. She was left frustrated and uncertain. Then, one Monday morning, she opened the little free library and found another note, along with a box that looked like it had been hand-carved from a block of wood. All is lost, the note said. Our superior weaponry could not match their advantage in numbers. Our last hope is to send my lady's child forth into your keeping before they are upon us. As you keep books, so you may keep her child. Child? Megan thought with alarm. She opened the box. Nested inside the wood was a straw lining and an egg. It was large, not enormous like an ostrich egg, but it filled the palm of her hand. It was silvery green in colour, with markings that looked almost like scales. What do you do with eggs? Well, you keep them warm. She took it inside. And that's it, folks. There we go. It was an interesting little story. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you're having a great day and you have been following some of the micro short stories and enjoying the other try it stuff. Thank you for watching. Bye bye.